I'll talk to you today about the reason post-trib believers, people that believe in the post-trib rapture, um, why they don't understand biblical suffering. Okay? I'm not saying that they don't have suffering in their lives or bad times or whatever else, but they don't understand what it means to suffer as a Christian. I'm going to show you the reason why today in our study. Let's start out in Acts chapter 9. Turn in your King James Bible to Acts chapter 9. A lot of the stuff on YouTube that you see, a lot of that quote-unquote preaching is just a bunch of fluff. They're not even telling you to turn in your Bible. You always got to watch out for that. Um, posties uh, are some of the most uh, scriptural, scripturally ignorant people that you're ever going to run into. Of all the people that I've you know, gone back and forth with, debated with, if you want to call it that, um, since 2007 when I entered into the ministry, uh, the post-tribbers, I'm the most familiar with those. I've studied this issue for a very long time. Um, the Bible absolutely, totally teaches a the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble, falsely called the pre-trib rapture. But um, if you're familiar with a lot of the preaching and teaching here at King James Video Ministries, you understand what I'm talking about. But let's let's see what Christian suffering is all about. Acts chapter 9, verse 11. Let's begin there. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name call on thy name, you know, not believe in your heart. <laughs> Had to put that in there. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Post-tribbers would be fine right along there. Okay, oh, well, yes, we're going to go out and do all kinds of preaching the gospel and everything else, you know, soul winning, as they like to call it. Um, but look at verse 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Here's the difference. Just going to tell you right away, because I know post-tribbers usually don't get through the whole way through the thing. And I'm serious about that. I'll see comments all the time from the post-trib crowd, and I realize there's no way they watched the video because I covered that. Okay? If you're a post-tribber, you need to understand uh, you've been led into a false system. If you're newly saved and you don't really understand what's going on, Please watch the whole video. Okay, it's very important that you look up the scriptures. It's not about watching the video so I can get your monetized support. My channel's not monetized. Never has been, never will be. All right, you watching the whole thing doesn't mean I make more money or whatever else. I'm trying to get you to look up the scriptures. Okay, but here's the difference. Those of us that are what would be called pre-trib, okay, we believe that the body of Christ is going to be going up before the Antichrist is unleashed, right? We understand that our suffering is right now, okay? It's right now in our lives. I'm going to draw this here in a little bit. We go through suffering in our life right now. Post-tribbers, on the other hand, believe that their suffering comes in the future. They might say, oh, yeah, I, I suffer as a Christian. People make fun of me, but whatever. You're not going to see the, the level of suffering for them. They say, it's not that bad. We don't have it bad. You know, we have it so easy here in America, but we're going to have that suffering in the future. You see? And there's a big difference there. And I'm going to show you in this study why that difference is there. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we're going to go next. The Lord showed, well, he was telling Ananias, and he said, I'm going to have Saul, later called Paul, he's going to go through some things. Did he go through some things for the Lord? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. Here you have Paul explaining those things that he had to suffer. It says here, We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it. Suffers also can be made kind of like allow it. We, we put up with it, you know. 
But uh, verse 13, being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. If you are newly saved and you haven't been kicked around much by the lost world, by your family members, by people that go to church buildings, it's coming. You will be considered as the offscouring of the, you're like the filth of the world. Oh, you're in a cult. Oh, you're, you're evil. You're judgmental. You're this, you're that, all these things. You will be kicked around. You will suffer. Oh, well, it hasn't been that bad. And I've been saved for many, many years. I get along with a lot of people. Then you're lost. It's as simple as that. Either you're the worst Christian that's ever lived and just hiding and, and keeping your relig religion and your relationship with Jesus Christ secret, um, or you're just lost. It's as simple as that. I mean, there, there, there's no other way around it. The Bible says we're going to suffer. And if you're saved and you've been saved for a while, you know about the suffering. You know about the family problems. You know about the job problems and the health problems and, and the problems with your struggles with sin. And, and, it, and I'm going to show you these things in Scripture. But see, post-tribbers, and I've seen these guys a lot of times, they are believing that it's really not that bad. And they're really not that separate from the world, you know. And though there's a whole lot of other issues there. And they're saying, but it's going to get bad. See, it's gonna, we're going to have bad times in the future. And that's where it's all going to be. You know, see, they, they got that self-righteous thing there of a lost person. The self-righteous pride of a lost person. Say it that way. See, the, the, the whole thing is, and you'll see this with them. They'll get all worked up about pre-trib rapture is dangerous because people are not going to be ready. When the Antichrist shows up, there's going to be people and they're going to, be, they're going to fall away. And, they're, and I always say, and, and then what? You believe in eternal security? Well, yes. Well, then what does it matter? If somebody like myself is deceived in, into believing the pre-trib rapture and all of a sudden the Antichrist shows up, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, uh, all of a sudden I'm going to lose my salvation or something? Come on. And there's dispensational stuff there that they don't understand either. But, um, but you see it there. Suffering. Okay? What kind of suffering? External suffering. People attacking you. Casting out your name as evil. And, and you know, ridiculing you and persecuting you and whatever else. That's external suffering. What people are doing to you. All right? Let's look about internal suffering. Romans chapter 7. Back to the book of Romans, right before 1 Corinthians. I have to say that for new believers. Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, for the, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And here's the key to it. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. That's the internal suffering. Waking up every day and, oh, I can't believe I had those dreams. I'm sorry, Lord, I don't even know where that stuff came from. And then about that time, a thought comes into the mind, some kind of perverse thing or profanity or some other kind of wickedness. And, oh, and just all day long. And you go to the grocery store and there's the rock music and you think, oh, I used to listen to that song. And, and you start to feel your flesh wanting to, oh, you know, no, stop, stop. Oh, man, no. And, and, uh, you know, you, you, I think I ought to lay a track down over there. I'll, maybe I should witness that person. Your flesh is fighting you on that. And, and just that struggle every day, every day, in, in and out. Just this struggle with the flesh. 
O wretched man that I am, who shall del deliver me? Deliver me. Are you looking for deliverance from your flesh? If you're a post-tribber, does it bother you? Do you bother yourself? Say it that way. Does your propensity to sin, is that something that's a great concern to you? Is it something that you, you really get upset about? And you're saying, I, I really would like to get out of this thing and whatever. Most post-tribbers I've met, they're not even bothered by their sin. They don't think that they're sinners. They're good people, you see, and they're, they're getting ready to go through the tribulation. They're going to be going through there and they're going to show how strong they are as a Christian. You see, because that's when the suffering is really going to start. When we see the Antichrist over there and he confirms the, the covenant thing and, and all of a sudden, you know, it's all the mark of the beast and everything, they're just going to come out. They're going to shine as lights in this dark world. And boy, it's, the righteousness is going to really pour forth. Yeah. I don't know of one postie. I've never met one that says a whole lot about the struggle between their flesh and their spirit. I've never met one. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 25. Went through chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. Let's look at chapter 8, verse 14 through 25. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be, notice the conditional clause there, if, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of the tribulation are not word. oh wait, no. Um, for I reckon that the sufferings that are on the way, that are coming, because life isn't too bad right now for us Christians, but it will be someday when we have our heads cut off. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time. You say, well, that's just the first century. How cute. <laughs> uh, no, it's any Christian that's ever lived. You can say that. It's not just confined to the first century there. And Paul's writing to the people there in, in Rome and whatever. And, and they're the only ones that's... No, no, no. Any Christian. I reckon that's the sufferings of this present time. External sufferings. How people treat you. And the internal struggle that you have between your flesh and your spirit. Always that desire there to sin. And you do things that you know you shouldn't be doing. And you feel like dirt when you do that. And you get out of fellowship with the Lord. And you just, you just feel awful. The sufferings of this present time. Verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Unless you're a post-tribber because you might go into the time period there and take the mark, then you are damned to hell. So it doesn't work too good. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. What kind of hope do you have if you're a poster, post-tribber? It's up to you to endure to the end. It's up to you to, to get into that time period and suffer and, and everything else. And you have to go and, and, and don't take the mark and whatever. You don't have hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, lost people suffer, sure they do. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Read Ephesians chapter 1. The redemption of the purchased possession. If you're saved, God didn't just buy you so that he can lose you later on. All right? You are saved. The Lord's going to redeem your body. It's called the resurrection. We'll be doing some more studies on that. Are you looking forward to the redemption? Are you looking forward to not having to deal with this body anymore? This corruptible body? You always have to take care of it? It's so funny. It's such a contradiction because, you, you know, you have to keep your body in good health. You have to eat the right things, get enough sleep, get exercise. It's basically the three parts of, of keeping yourself healthy. Good sleep, proper sleep, proper nutrition, and proper exercise. It's really just that simple. But yet when you do that, your flesh is stronger. 
So you eat junk food and whatever else. Well, then then your flesh kind of gets you because you're sick all the time. So it's 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 just uh, there's really no way to make it right. It, you just have to get through it. You have to suffer. Oh no, that's out in the future. We don't know what it's like to suffer. Really? Get saved and then you will. Verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Um, what are you looking forward to? Post-tribbers are looking forward to seeing the Antichrist. Oh, no. Was your, oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are looking forward to seeing the Antichrist. Because that's when the Great Tribulation starts. And that's when your suffering starts to come. You are looking forward to something that you will see with your eyes. You know what I'm looking forward to as a Christian? A born-again saved Christian? I'm looking forward to a sound I'm not living by sight. I'm living by faith. I'm waiting to hear my name called and come up hither. You say, when's it going to happen? I have no idea. None. Well, could it be September 23rd of 2020? No. No. We don't know. We don't know. It's imminent. It could be at any time. You see? Look at the verse. Look at the verse. Oh, there's nothing, you know, that's all John Nelson Darby. No, it's a King James Bible. Okay. Uh, well, there, there, there's the pre-trib, the pre it's, there's no scripture for it. Oh, there's, there are hundreds of scriptures that prove that the body of Christ is gone before the time of Jacob's trouble gets started. Again, there's no term, the Great Tribulation in the King James Bible. Please understand that. It's a description of the time that's coming. It's not a title. The title is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Or Daniel's 70th week, back in the book of Daniel. But look at this. Verse 24, for we are saved by hope. That redemption that's talking about there in the future. Verse 23, the redemption of our body. But hope that is seen is not hope. Oh, I see the Antichrist and now I can have hope that Jesus has come. No, no, no. That's not for Christians. Do you understand? The time of Jacob's trouble is for Israel. It's not for us today. We are saved by hope, faith, not of sight. But hope that is seen is not hope. I see the Antichrist. Well, then you don't have hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Hey, there's the Antichrist. Now I can kind of time out. Okay, I have uh, exactly... Three and a half years or whatever your kooky belief system says. You see? You don't have hope. You're seeing. You're looking for something that you can see. You're watching the news in earnest expectation. Oh, oh, uh, what's the guy's name? Jared Kushner or whatever. Oh, he, he's going over and he's talking to the Palestinians and the Jews. Oh, this might be the covenant. Oh, this could be it. And then the Antichrist could show up. You're looking at sight right here. You're not listening for come up hither. Verse 25, But if we hope for that we see not, I'm hoping for Jesus Christ to come back soon. I'm hoping for things that I can't see. I'm listening for a sound, that's all. I'm not trying to see Jesus Christ come back or the Antichrist show up. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You know, it, it takes some real patience. To wait for the Lord. I've been disappointed many times. I thought he'd come back, you know, in the year 2000 and, and whatever else. And then that starts the, you know, the thousand year, whatever. Uh, no, it didn't work. Um, well, maybe he'll come back in 2011 for the 400th anniversary of the King James, but didn't work. Uh, well, maybe he'll come for this and maybe he'll come for that. And, you know, it's springtime. Maybe he comes kind of like the Song of Solomon, you know. It's springtime. Arise up, my beloved, my fair one, come away. No didn't happen. Oh, September 23rd and whatever else. I fell for that early on and, and no, it didn't happen. No, it didn't happen. It takes patience to wait for Jesus Christ. But a lot of these guys that have gone post now, post trib or mid trib, whatever else, or we see the Antichrist, which is insanity. Christians are in heaven in Revelation chapter 5 before the Antichrist is unleashed in Revelation chapter 6. Give me a break. Just read plain English. 
But see, people give up their patience. They give up their hope. I can't wait for Jesus anymore. I don't think he's coming. Oh, if you look at it differently, I think we're going to be here. Be here for what? So that you can see something supernatural to confirm your faith? Think about that. Think long and hard about that. You are looking for something to confirm your faith. You know, you ought to read over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 of the gospel, and it says, unless ye have believed in vain. Can you really say that you've put your faith in Jesus Christ if you're looking for the Antichrist? I trow not. All right. But let me just let me just draw this thing out here, and then we'll get into a few more scriptures and then we're done. Uh, let me just draw this thing how this works. Okay? Going to draw two different things here. First, we have a saved, born again, Christian. All right? Saved, born again, Christian. Here's your life as a Christian. And what do you have? You have a life of suffering. Here at the cross, there we have the cross there. You are purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. You see, right here is your purification at the cross. At the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my sin rolled away. You see, might have got the words wrong there a little bit. Not in my notes, but here you go. You're purified right there. And what happens? You're going along through the life of suffering, the life of sanctification. Sanctification comes from suffering. Okay, it's kind of like a, a child and they burn their hand on a stove, a hot stove, and they learn, don't touch the hot stove. You stub your toe on the, the corner of the cabinet or whatever sticking out there and you say, oh, don't walk so close to the thing the next time. You get on your bicycle to try to ride as a child and, and you fall down and crash because you tried to get down the hill too fast. Or, you're suffering, but you're learning. Okay, as a Christian. You go and you get saved back here. You get purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Born again. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And you go to your family and say, Guess what? I just got saved. And they say, I thought something was a little different. Okay, so what? You know, well, you're a Christian. You were, you've been a Christian for years. No, 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 no. I was a false convert. You know, and all of a sudden you see that, you know, because, see, in your past you were like they are right now. So you say I was a false convert, you're implying that they are a false convert and right now, and they are. And all of a sudden you start to, to, to say, it's amazing, I learned that the King James Bible is God's perfect word, and the other ones come from the Vatican. I mean, literally, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. I mean, it's the Vatican, you know, making, making translations with, you know, churches separated from us. It's in Vatican II, the Second Ecumenical Council that was back in the 1960s. And I, I found all, all this neat stuff. And all of a sudden, those uh, Christian family members or Christian friends start to get a little bit radical. Or they start to get a little bit uh, hateful, you might say. You get burned, you see, and you suffer for it. But yet it's sanctifying you as a Christian. And what are we looking for? We're looking for that time when we go up and we have peace. The redemption of the purchased possession, our blessed hope. Let me show you that. Here, we already looked at it, but I'm going to write it here. The resurrection and redemption. See, the resurrection includes 
uh, dead saints coming up, but also living saints being changed. The redemption of our mortal bodies, you see? Resurrection and redemption. And we're not looking for it, we're listening for it. Okay, if I said looking, forgive me. We're listening for it. There's nothing visible that we're going to see. Okay, I've had weird dreams and things, rapture dreams or whatever else, and, and I'm outside and I feel something weird and I look up into the sky and I see the clouds part and there's a door and whatever else. Well, John saw that, but I don't know if we're going to see that or not. I don't think so. But I'm listening for a sound. That's what I'm listening for. My name being called and come up hither. And up I go. And that's my hope. You see, this right here is hope. The rapture going up right there. That's hope. But what about a posty? Post-tribber, I like to call them. <coughs> we'll go down here. The self-righteous. And they all are. Never met a post-tribber that's not. Self-righteous post Tribber. What do you have? Well, you see, you have just a normal life. Okay? Normal life. But over here, all of a sudden, guess who shows up? The Antichrist. And great tribulation. Like that. They show up right there. And then, then you get to prove how good a Christian you are. Because then comes the red line of suffering. And purification. And that's exactly what they believe. You say, well, John Nelson Darby, I, just, I love to kick this thing. John Nelson Darby was the first one to say the rapture, to teach pre-trib rapture in 1830 and all this other stuff. Um, okay, just go with that for a minute. Okay, who was teaching the post-trib thing before John Nelson Darby? Oh, well, if you do the study, it was the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church within the Catechism literally says the church's final purification, speaking of this time, the church has to go through a time, final time of purification. And they teach a skewed version of the Great Tribulation. I get that. But the whole point is they're saying that there's a future time coming, that there's an Antichrist Pope or whatever else, and that that's going to be the final time of purification. Hmm. How about that? So, and of course, you know, hopefully... Maybe, perhaps you'll make it to heaven, but if you're not a strong enough Christian and you take that mark of the beast, well, who knows? See? There is no hope. You have to endure to the end to be saved. You have to suffer. Your purification comes in over here. You know? Kind of like a Catholicism that uh, teaches uh, you go through your life, you know, you are being saved. But you see, the purification doesn't come back here. It comes over here in the future. You see, if you die as a Catholic before this time of great tribulation, the final purification, then you go to a nice little place called uh, purgatory. Where you get to burn for a while. Draw some crude flames there. There's your purgatory. And here's the faithful Catholic, you know, uh, kneeling down and, and uh, praying. There's the faithful Catholic there. They're, they're being purified. Their sins are getting the final purification. It's God's hospital for sick Christians. 
what the Catholic Catechism actually teaches. But you see the difference? And this is, again, I've talked to the post-tribbers. I understand this. You look at their life, there's no suffering. They're not being called out. All right? They're not being, having people turn against them or whatever else. A lot of times they're loved by the world. And it's no purification back here and we're waiting for the blessed hope to get out of the suffering that we're going through right now. No. Suffering is going to be coming in the future. It's not, we don't know what it's like to suffer, but we're going to one day. Many people aren't going to make it when they get over to here. Yeah. I realize I spelled that wrong. Terrible, isn't it? Let me just fix my error here quickly. I don't want people thinking I'm a dumb hillbilly or anything. That's a joke there if you can't tell. <clears throat> Suffering. Got it right that time, I think. I think everything else is good. So I don't have a spell checker on there. Just joking. Here's the spell checker, you know. Uh, <laughs> but let's continue here. Two more places to turn to. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 through 29. Let's see here a bit more about this thing of suffering. According to my earnest expectation and my hope. My what? My hope? What's your hope down here? I hope I see the Antichrist, because then we'll know for sure that we're right. And we can destroy all those pre-trib rapture, you know, mafia people. <laughs> My hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. You live in a purifying hope, do you, Posty? No, you don't. You don't think that Jesus Christ is going to come back at any time. He has to come first. Why bother purifying your life? Just live a nice, normal life. You're being saved, you know. So when he shows up, then you can say, oh, I better get right. Better start doing things right. No, you purify your life because you don't know when he's coming back. Imminent return of Jesus Christ, you see. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You don't say that if things are going great in your life. Well, I wish I could die. You'll say that as a Christian. You'll get to some times where you just say, Lord, can't you just take my life? Give it to somebody else that needs it or whatever else. There's some child suffering from cancer or whatever. Just just, just enough already. Why do I have to suffer like this? I, I'm sick. I'm, I'm, people hate my guts. I, I, you know, My own family doesn't even want to see me anymore. Probably going to lose my job. I was witnessing on the site the other day. I got called in the office for it. God, can't you just end this? Die is gain. You believe that down here, Posty? Check yourself. You can get mad at me and everything else. And, oh, you're so sarcastic and you're so. You know why I'm sarcastic? Because some of you people, your eyes are so glazed over from watching so much stuff and just so much stuff being inputted into mind. I, I have to say something to shock you enough to make you think, hey, you know what? Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I better examine myself to see whether I'm in the faith. That's why I'm saying that this way. Verse 22, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. To die, in other words. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. You realize that as a Christian. You realize those times when you feel really, really down and you just say, Lord, just take me home. Just end this thing. And Lord will just gently remind you, uh, you're there for a reason. You need to be where you're at. Not moving to special little Christian cities where you have a good local church fellowship and whatever else, that kind of nonsense. No, God saved you and he has you in your community, in your country, your state, whatever. He has you there for a reason. To shine as a light in that dark world. 
it's more needful for you to abide in the flesh where you're at. God has you here for a reason. If you're saved, if you're born again, yeah, suffering gets bad sometimes, but God has you going through it for a reason. Verse 25, And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit and with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. How many church buildings can say that? Stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. <laughs> they don't even have the same Bible in most of the church buildings out there. And the guy standing up in the pulpit doesn't even believe the book that he's preaching out of. Very, very few of these guys actually believe the book. And the ones that say that they do, they don't follow it. they got a church building and all the trappings that go along with that. Verse 28, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation than that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, it's just believe, just believe, only believe, only believe. You don't have to call upon Him. You don't have to have a changed life afterward. Just believe. Not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I'm born again. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I believe He died for my sins. His blood has washed away my sins. Okay, is there suffering? Is there suffering in your life? Are you getting kicked around by family? Do you suffer with your flesh on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you wish you could die sometimes? Well, you know, I, I don't know if I'd go that far. Then you didn't get saved. Do you have hope for the resurrection and the redemption of your wicked body? Are you looking forward to it? Well, I think we, we probably are going to see the Antichrist. You're looking for something. I'm listening for someone. You see the difference there? Salvation is so simple. It's just common sense when you get right down to it. But these people, they go in and they'll just dissect parts of it and they'll say, it's just belief. It's just belief. That's not what our text says here. Verse 29, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. And I've said it for many years. You put your faith in Jesus Christ, you truly get born again. Suffering comes automatically. It'll just happen. You'll see it. If you're messing around in sin, you'll suffer for it. God will chasten you. As a good father would chasten his son or his daughter, God will punish you for messing around in sin. But more so than that, you'll suffer with that old man that's always trying to get back and say, oh, you know, listen to that rock music, eat that wrong stuff, or do this thing or, or say these things or think these things or that suffering is going to be there. And then you're going to have the external suffering of people attacking you for your newfound faith, your new life in Christ Jesus. It's a life of suffering, you see? But you have hope because one day the Lord is going to resurrect both the living and dead saints and He's going to redeem your vile body. Unless you're a post-tribber and you go down here. And then you're going to have to prove how good a Christian you are. And some aren't going to make it. You wicked works. Salvation pervert you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Oh, the attitude. Oh, the, get saved. Okay? These things are sweet to a Christian. My uh, arrogant, sarcastic, blah, blah, blah. When you're saved and you're born again... I don't care how caustic a preacher is, if he's born again, it'll be a blessing to your soul. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Resurrection. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall see him, and they'll be happy because they're going to see him in person. It, it doesn't say that. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We're not looking for him. Here, we're listening. You get the difference? If you're a post-tribber, you're looking. You're looking for the Antichrist of all people. If you believe the catching up is before the time of Jacob's trouble, you're listening for Jesus Christ. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Blessed hope. Do you have the blessed hope today? Are you looking forward to meeting Jesus Christ in the air? Do you ever have uh, an experience where somebody says, uh, hey, you know, I got a bunch of stuff to do and, and everything, so go back to your place and, and whatever, and um, when the time is ready, when, I'm, when I get things done and I'm ready to come get you, I'll call for you. And you go home and you forget about whatever else and all of a sudden you hear that phone ring. I wonder if it's them. And you go up and look and it's a telemarketer. <sighs> you know. All right, well, you kind of go back to doing your, your thing and whatever else and, and you forget about it again. And, but you're always kind of keeping that in there and all of a sudden that phone rings and you go there. There's the call you, you've been waiting for. Someday I'm going to get the call I'm waiting for. Can't wait. I hope it's soon. I've had about enough of this stupid world. I've had about enough of my stupid self and all the, the health issues and things. And, and I'm in very good health, but I'm saying just constant struggles with this and struggles with that. Just, can we end it? I have hope. If you've been deceived by this system down here, you don't have hope. You're looking for him, the Antichrist. And you can lie all you want. Oh, no, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Get it straightened out. You have to get it straightened out. It is your salvation. So that is going to be it. I do pray that you take heed to these things. Um, there's nothing that is more important. And uh, we are going into some really, really rough times, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> and... Uh, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'm, I'm looking forward to Him coming back and calling me. I get the call, come up hither. Oh, finally. And I'm gone. And if you miss it, there you go. You will get your chance. Let me just end with that thought. Post-tribbers, you are going to get your chance. You're going to see what real suffering is if the Lord lives, you know, even gives you a chance to get saved. Um, it's a good chance that He's going to you know, send you strong delusion. But uh, if He gives you a chance to get saved in this time period, oh, buddy, you're going to get to prove how righteous you are. You absolutely will. Me? Nope. I'm leaving. I'm doing my suffering now. I was purified back there years ago. And I get to suffer and I'm going to be looking for the hope, the blessed hope. Get it sorted out today. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to K. 
King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.